Let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you here today. We have a fantastic guest and on a great, great topic for all of us. And I'm really looking forward to our conversation. The forum is based geographically in the United States. Uh, most of our guests, most of our participation has been for the United States. But we've always sought to have a global perspective. We've hosted guests from around the world. And I've actually physically hosted this from multiple countries. And today, what I'd like to do is to really reframe our usual preoccupation with how to reform higher education and to do so on the global stage through the mechanism of the OECD. And the United States is a member of country, but this covers countries all over the world. And our guest is someone who's been working on this global stage for quite some time. Director Andreas Schleicher uh, is a very, very well-known scholar, um, leader in the field of higher education. He is perhaps best known for creating and leading the PISA program. And he is, for my money, a fascinating thinker about where education might be headed. Now, let me stop with the introduction. Let me actually bring our guest up on stage. Uh, Director Schleicher, good afternoon. Hello, Brian. Good to meet you. Very good to see you. Uh, would you like me to call you Director Schleicher, Andreas, or something else? You can just call me Andreas. Well, I'm, I'm, in a very American way, I'm happy to do that, Andreas. Um, very good. Thank you for making the time to join us. Um, where, where have we found you today? I just came from London and um, in Paris now. Ah, ah, and I, I remember reading, uh, uh, I think it was Michael Gove, who said that you are the best expert on British higher education, and yet you're a German who lives in France. So I, I thought that was a, a great, uh, a great plot. Um, we have a we have a tradition on the, on the Future Trends Forum of asking people to introduce themselves in a particular way. We ask them to speak about what they plan to do for the next year. So what projects are coming up for you and what ideas, what topics are uppermost in your mind for the next year? Interesting question. You know, we have done a lot on, on formal education schools, but uh, what we see increasingly how important the foundations early on in the lives of people are. So we want to make uh, education better visible, not just um, academic outcomes, but also social emotional outcomes, uh, mm. make them visible, make them measurable so that they become tangible for, for public mm. policy. At the other end of the spectrum, you know, upskilling, reskilling are uh, increasingly important in many countries. And I hope by <coughs> within the next year, at least, we can put together a framework how we can, uh, <coughs> how we can better both measure this and also look at uh, demand and supply. Uh, we have uh, still very front-loaded education systems, and that's you know mm -hmm. even the term uh, higher education may not you know be so suitable for the future. I think uh, mm. we should probably just talk about learning and about lifelong and life-wide learning, and get people to take more ownership over what they learn and how they learn and where they learn and what kind of. Uh, setting and also when in their lives they invest in learning. And that's really what uh, next year in our work will be very much focused on. Wow, that's a tremendous ambition, uh, you know, kind of incorporating the wide variety of formal education with the huge amount of informal learning. Um, can you give us any hints or glimpses of what that framework might look like? Yeah, you know, in uh, December this year, 10th of December, actually, we're going to uh, <coughs> present first results from our skills survey. That is the foundation for all of that. Basically, we went out mm -hmm. to uh, five to 10,000 adults in every country to their households and actually assessed their skills directly. We didn't look at, you know, what degree did you got, what qualifications. We actually directly assessed what they know, what they could do with what they know. Uh, we also asked them, how do you use their skills? You know, that's another question, you know, uh, sure. you can only create value when you actually get a chance to actually deploy your knowledge and skills and uh, uh, put that together. So that data set is the platform for our more conceptual work uh, next year in this in this sphere. But it's covering the group uh, from age 16 to uh, to 65. So I do think it's going to be a really, really interesting data set. Oh, very interesting. This is a, a kind of a glimpse of of not quite all of human learning, but a, but a real interesting crack into that picture. Wow. Yeah, particularly it brings on a map all of those who may have, may have learned a lot, but don't have formal mm -hmm. degrees and qualification. And I think 
uh, increasingly. Uh, we have, uh, you know, lots of people who learn in other ways than through formal education, and we should, you know, put them on the map, understand what they know, and also give them a fair chance to to deploy their skills. Many of our you know, many parts of our labor markets are still very much biased towards credentials. You mm -hmm. know, they only see you through the lens of how you once studied and where you once studied rather than, you know, figuring out what your, your actual talent is. And I think we can do better. And in this time, we need to do better. There's, a, there's an American expression. I'm wondering if you're using this in Europe at all, the uh, paper ceiling. Mm hmm yeah, so this, the, the, and so it looks like you're helping us break through the paper ceiling. People who lack the credentials but have the skills and capacity. To... Yeah. Oh, brilliant. You know, I think in 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 in, in increasingly in countries, uh, I mean, we see a, a kind of kind of quite polarized world. You have, you know, some people who you know finish with a good you know high school degree, they go into university, they earn a lot of money in their later lives, and an increasing share uh, of young people who no longer can you know leverage what they know and what they can do because <clears throat> they get they get crowded out and i think um mm. uh, we will need everybody in the knowledge economy and th therefore we should give people the kind of opportunity that that serves them best and 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 that's really i think what our skill survey is about and we do that across the world at least in, no, not across the world in the oecd membership mm -hmm. so i think we're going to see also uh, which countries are most advanced in you know that idea of lifelong lifeway mm -hmm. learning that would be quite a uh, quite a ranking to have the, yeah the, the, you yeah. Know, the best country for lifelong learning and then maybe down the road to break it down into you know the best yeah. region or you know the best uh, uh, province um, uh, friends, if you're if you're new to the forum, I'm I'm going to ask uh, our guest, um, our very kind guest, uh, a couple of questions more, and then uh, I'm going to turn it over to you. So uh, as uh, Andreas and I get to speak um, and think about what you'd like to ask him, uh, think about what questions uh, and what ideas you'd like us to discuss. And again, remember those buttons on the bottom of the screen uh, to share them all. Uh, thanks, by the way, in the chat to P.F. Anderson for sharing an OECD publication. Um, I guess uh, one of the questions I, I would have uh, has to, and this is a question that's in everybody's mind, um, is uh, what, you know, where does AI uh, play a role right now? Um, one of our, our, our dear friends, who is actually geographically closer to you, uh, American University of Armenia, um, uh, Brent Anders, asks this, is how does generative AI play into teaching and learning within the scope of international economic development and cooperation? What do you think? Yeah, you know, I think there are two angles to this. Uh, one is the what question, and the other is the how question, you know. Mm -hmm. and the, the perhaps most difficult question is, you know, what should we learn for a world uh, dominated by AI? Now, how do we complement, not substitute the artificial intelligence we've created in, in our computer? And I do think we need to ask some hard questions here. You know, it's very clear that the kind of things that are easy to teach easy to test are now very easy to digitize to automate now this mm -hmm. world no longer rewards you just for what you know now google knows everything uh, you get rewarded for what you can do with what you know you get rewarded for you know connecting the dots where the next big idea innovation comes from so i think that what question is incredibly important and um you know asking ourselves you know what are the Probably, you know, when you teach even traditional subjects like mathematics, can you think like a mathematician? It's going to be a lot more important than, you know, uh, remembering formulas and equations. Now, or, you know, I'm a scientist by background. And, you know, I often, mm -hmm. you know, even in university, you can see how we sometimes teach science like religion. You know, we make you believe in some scientific theory. We then give you lots of exercises to practice. And in the end, we test whether you remember what somebody considers the right answer. That has nothing to do with science. You know, science is about inquiry. Mm -hmm. And I think those kinds of questions are ones that we should really, really ask ourselves. And the other question is the how question. You know, what is very, very clear is that, you know, AI is not just, you know, ChatGPT and its many friends. It's not just a good kind of resource of knowledge, but it's also become a very powerful tool of delivery. Uh, you can, you know, while you study mathematics on a computer the computer can figure out how you learn and then you know make your learning experiences so much more granular so much more adaptive if you go to south korea these days you know students have digital tutors they follow them and they actually give them their you know personalized homework 
that how question I think is also very, very important. I do think, you know, <clears throat> on both fronts, we should, you know, do some serious uh, soul searching and, and, and that development is, is, is incredibly fast and uh, uh, labor markets will be, and I think that's what this question probably is mostly about, will be less and less forgiving for that. You know, they will more and more test you mm -hmm. on what contribution you can make over and above what people get from AI. You know? At the very same time, you know, I, I think the idea that AI is going to replace humans, I think is, is quite naive. You know, even if, you know, ChatGPT one day can, you know, think critically, it, doesn't mean that humans should be able should do less of that. Uh, so I actually think you know some of the human skills will always be incredibly important. There's um, there's a really prescient book by a university president uh, Joseph Aoun um, called Robot Proof, where he he puts forth the idea that we need to teach and research uh, the topics that humans do better than robots. Basically, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, and that seems like a good principle. Uh, mm. One to hear to. Um, Actually, this is a this is a big research project we have at the OECD. We work with AI scientists to basically give AI technologies assessments that usually humans do, and so we can see yeah. how well does AI do on what we consider human tasks. Precisely to to answer the kind of question you raise, it's a, it's a very important kind of insight. And what we of course want to do is to anticipate the evolution of AI. I mean, so far. We haven't done very well. You know, we all got surprised by ChatGPT. You know, we shouldn't get surprised because it was actually quite predictable development for computer scientists. So I do think, you know, we as humans should do a lot better in anticipating where is the frontier for technology and then what does it mean for, you know, human uh, skills. No? Have you seen any, any universities uh, in the OECD that are doing an especially good job of that kind of anticipation? You know, it's probably hard to sort of uh, group that by university. I actually think it's largely individuals. It's, you know, people mm -hmm. in universities that, you know, do that. They, they look at this from different ways. Uh, A, you know, better understand, you know, the emergence of AI uh, technologies and the evolution or simply, you know, <clears throat> looking through what that means for, for teaching and learning. I think you have a lot of people on that. I don't think we have a lot of global exchange on that you know we have it has taken us quite some time to patch together you know the mm -hmm. expertise that exists across the OECD and I, I I do hope that we'll get more and more people really you know looking into this kind of questions now well, there's a lot of ad hoc work uh, yeah the bottom up uh, bottom up work um, so first of all, Brent, the, thank you for that great question. And Andreas, thank you for that very, very rich and thoughtful answer. Uh, a second question I'd like to put to you comes from a different part of the world, um, intellectually, which has to do with uh, the big demographic transition that we're all living through. Um, all the OECD countries are experiencing this, uh, where childbirth rates are, are falling rapidly, uh, and we are living longer and longer. Uh, and you can tell that from the two of us. With, between the two of us, we have a, a quite a bit of white hair on the screen. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of the, the traditional vision of, of colleges and universities was to serve the 18 to 22 year old. Um, but how does that change as that 18 year old population dwindles and as the over 65 population expands? Are, are you seeing any examples of institutional change along these lines? Or is there anything we should consider as we look ahead? Yeah, you know, uh, 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 first of all, it's not everywhere the same. You know, I think we have some some serious imbalances. If you look to, I was just last week in Africa, in those countries, you know, you have a very large youth population. In the Middle East, you have a very large youth population. But you're right, in OECD countries, uh, the demographics work the other way around. But, uh, you know, that doesn't imply that there is less demand for, 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 for education. It just shifts. And what I should say is that so far universities have not done a great job in, in in opening up you know still you know most university is basically a full-time enterprise you know you have to study it's very hard to combine uh, learning and work in many countries still uh, both from the employer side but also from the institution side universities are still geared towards, you know, awarding initial degrees. If you go to a university and says, you know, I want to do my my master over the next uh, 15 years, they'll tell you, sorry, we can't help you. And I think yeah. Yeah. Uh, we need to see more part-time learning opportunities. We need to see more micro-credentials. We need to see more 
granular learning. We need to see diff maybe different opening times for, for courses. Now, I, I think mm -hmm. actually that I don't think that transition has yet happened. And there is a growing mismatch between an emerging need for upskilling and reskilling. And, and if universities don't wake up to this, you know, uh, employers will do that, but they will do second best of that. And they will do that very job specific and often very narrow. And I think we risk to lose a very, very important part of universities, namely that is, you know, broadening people's view, building strong foundations, not just educating you for your next job, but giving you, you know, that those knowledge and skills to, to change tomorrow's world. And I, I, I worry that this gets lost if if our education systems do not make that transition. No. Some are doing better. Uh, your northern neighbor, Canada, I think is quite well on its way. I think they have a good kind of uh, adult learning tradition. Countries like Sweden and Norway in Europe are further along, but I do think in general, I don't think we are yet, yet okay. there, no. I wonder if Canada will find itself forced to do this since they just cut back their international student enrollment in, in a major way. Um, friends, let me, let me stop badgering our, our good guest. Let me uh, give the questions over to you now. Um, uh, and we have several that are already in the pipeline. And uh, Andreas, I will put these on the screen and read them out loud um, so you can hear them. Uh, this is a question from um, our good friend in Malta. Uh, and Philip asks, higher education institutions across OECD nations are in increasing financial distress. Is this driving innovation or only retrenchment? Yeah, you know, um, it's actually an interesting question. First of all, again, there's huge variability in, in spending per student in higher education across countries. Um, I, I must say, actually, we haven't, we need to find smarter ways to share the costs and benefits of higher education. In mm. many countries, mm. you know, US is a kind of exception on this, but in many countries, basically, governments have said, you know, it's a public mm. business. We pay for all of this, enrollment expands, and that means, you know, less and less is available for student because, you know, government funding doesn't expand as fast as, as student numbers. So I think that explains the decline in unit costs. And then there are other pressures, mm -hmm. you know, I think very, very clearly these days, you know, uh, <clears throat> and I think uh, I was, you know, in London this morning, they have a quite well-established system of uh, income contingent loans you basically mm -hmm. you want to study and uh, uh, the government says yes here's the money but you know later on if you earn a really good salary please start to pay back no? and I, I do think we need to find a more scalable approach uh, to uh, to the financing of higher education that it doesn't impose risks on young people now I don't like the US system where you basically you know end up with a high level of debt and then you can you know, if you don't have a great job, you have really difficulty. So I think we need to find ways that, you know, on the one hand, make money accessible, don't leave people with the risk, and also make public investment where these investments are most needed. I actually think it's a matter of becoming smarter in uh, in, in investment. And I think the money that is available publicly at the moment, I, I would think is, is enough. Frankly, you know, if you ask me, you know, if you had a little bit of more public money, Mm -hmm. I would probably spend it rather on kindergarten than on higher education. Why is that? Because there are so many children born that, you know, may not have the support they get from parents and uh, come from disadvantaged backgrounds, may not speak the language in which they operate, and they'll never get a chance. Mm -hmm. You know, it, uh, I think uh, the, the, the life chance, chances, the dependence on social background that we still see, that, you know, access to education is so much you know, driven by where you were born, not what you know, um, that I think we need to do better uh, and uh, build strong foundations. And I actually think in higher education, we just need to be a lot smarter. Governments need to make, you know, uh, <coughs> uh, more strategic investments and um, then find ways to, to, to give people access uh, without much of a risk. And there, again, I think they are quite good good solutions around the world uh, <clears throat> uh, for that. Now, I also think, you know, in, in my country, Germany, the industry pays a big mm -hmm. share of advanced education mm -hmm. uh, through the system of uh, apprenticeship. You know, you learn at the workplace in part, and that is financed by the by companies. So I think, actually, if we put society's resources together rather than just, you know, putting universities under pressure, I, I do think we can find 
find find good good answers to this. What is very clear is that the demand for learning is going to continue to rise. You know, even if we have fewer people, if, if even if we have aging societies, uh, we all will need to m much more invest in our, you know, upgrade continuous upgrading of our knowledge and skills. Mm, mm, I'm thinking. Uh, well, first of all, Philip, thank you for the great question. And if I'm not mistaken, the Malta is tuition free and also gives some students a, a yeah. stipend to, to, to live on. In the in the chat, we have a great observation um, uh, from one commentary. Says, "I feel so privileged. I was born in Brazil and went to public university for my bachelor's and master's degrees, tuition free, no debt. I'm so happy the Brazilian government has been supporting this. So, thank you, thank you for that comment." Um, we have uh, we have more questions coming in, so please, friends, uh, don't be shy. I want to make sure everyone gets a chance to ask. Uh, and this is one from the United States, from upstate New York, uh, our friend uh, Elaine Lasta, who is a librarian. Uh, and she asked a good library-related question. How do libraries need to change in support of informal learning that breaks through the paper ceiling? Do you see partnership opportunities across different entities where libraries can get involved? <laughs> You know, I don't have much expertise, but I think it's a very intriguing question. You know, I think it's it's basically behind that is the question. You know, how do we become better in you know making knowledge a kind of public good, make knowledge available in our societies? You know, at the moment there are still many, many barriers. Uh, they they can be you know physical access barriers or physical access. There can be financial barriers, and mm -hmm. you know I think that dumbest mistake that societies make is you know restrict access to knowledge. Mm. You know, I think actually. You know, whatever we can do to facilitate that people have, you know, easier access to the information in the right form. I think, you know, one thing for, for libraries probably also uh, is so important to better personalize access. Now, in the moment, we still have, you know, you have to adapt to the to the product. You have to read the book in the form in which is, you know, written. I do think in the future, probably you know libraries will need to be much more going towards the the, the reader the user and then make information accessible in forms that that matches their needs and interests and abilities oh, that's interesting I, I i've been finding uh audiobooks have been um, yeah. really picking up as a as yeah. a way to and there's also foolish arguments you know can you is audiobook experience is that reading you know um yeah or you know think about the extreme you know think about people with dyslexia often they are incredibly entrepreneurial incredibly innovative but you know they're not just great readers and so if you find a way to you know uh, give them access to to, to knowledge uh, you probably super empower them in in, in ways I, I think just we have to you know think more about you know in the past libraries were designed for a very small elite you yes. know people who just study academically and tomorrow We'll need libraries for for everyone. No. <clears throat> oh, that's that's a great a great way of looking at this. Uh, do you do you foresee higher education doing more with open access, both uh, open access and scholarly publication, as well as open education resources? You know, I, I, I sincerely hope so. You know, I think the if if we want to uh, collectively address the world's challenges, we have to move towards a kind of open educational resource kind of architecture. Now, I think uh, it is both more efficient, you know, uh, it is, uh, it is, you know, from a perspective of equity, it's more, more equitable. And I do think, you know, we live in a time in which we have the possibilities to give every person on this planet an excellent education. You know, we're just not doing it. And I think open educational resources, open access is going to be a big part of that, that picture. Now. Oh, and I was actually, you know, last year very much involved in the eight, two years ago under mm. India's presidency. They actually made a big, yes. big uh, push in the G20 to advance on this. But, and what's quite disappointing to see how many other countries are still, you know, keeping to, you know, property rights. And, uh, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I, I do think, you know, we'll need to make progress on that. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. And and uh, again, uh, Elaine, thank you for that uh, excellent question. I'm always glad to see uh, libraries represented here. A quick question for all of you in the chat box. Um, do you mind if I uh, extract the chat box for a blog post on this later on? I'll uh, anonymize you if you like. Just let me know in the chat. Uh, some of you, like uh, P.T. Anderson, have been doing just great stuff, uh, sharing all kinds of resources. And uh, Cynthia Costal, thank you uh, for your for your comment. 
Um, we have we have more questions coming in, and uh, one comes another one from the United States from our, our good friend and, and previous guest uh, Ben Waldowski, and uh, he asks um, a question about workforce development. What are the most promising models you see globally for combining academic learning with practical work experience? <coughs> Things like dual studies, uh, dual stud studium, German model of degree apprenticeships. Yeah, you know, I think we will see more of that. You know. Uh, learning is not a place, it, learning is always an activity and the more we can actually, you know, mm. uh, bring the world of work and the world of learning uh, together, the more we will increase the relevance and uh, probably also the quality of learning, you know, and uh, A, we should recognize that many people learn best through practical experience. Now, that's mm. why, for example, countries with dual uh, system apprenticeships have much less youth unemployment. Uh, I mean, employment mm -hmm. prospect of young people are much better because again, you know, the system cater for people, but more generally, you know, I think we learn a lot through, through apprenticeship. You know, if you look at this historically, you know, learning in universities is a fairly recent phenomenon. You know, if you go back enough in history, we all learn through apprenticeship. We always learned from and with people. And actually, I think uh, some of that has shown to be very, very effective. Now, you often remember best what you learned in a kind of social uh, experience. So, um, and it's also a good way to keep learning relevant, particularly when you look at uh, technology, what we teach mm -hmm. in universities is often very quickly outdated. Uh, whereas if you bring students into the workplace, you keep to be at the frontiers. Uh, the last point I want to make to this in, um, is that, you know, it's also important that you work on real problems that have real consequences. You know, if you make a mistake in an apprenticeship situation, someone is going to go to you and say, look, you know, please correct that. If you'd make a mistake in a kind of abstract lecture hall, nobody cares. And I think sort of that, you know, taking responsibility, you know, for yourself, for the work that you do. I think all of those aspects to me suggest that, you know, better integrating uh, working and learning, um, I think is very, very meaningful. I would even say over time, you know, I actually am quite intrigued by, you know, uh, Singapore skills future system where, you know, mm -hmm. it's now much easier to learn smaller chunks in university and then, you know, combine them with, with work experience. And I, I think, you know, that's probably where we will be, will be going now. <clears throat> Excellent. Excellent. I mean, ben, thank you for that, for that great question. And before I could thank you for the answer, Andreas, we had a follow-up. Um, Elaine Lazda, the librarian who asked the earlier question, asks what the contrast is between apprenticeship and internship. Yeah, you know, I would say an apprenticeship is just a much more sustained and organized relationship. You know, interns come, you, you, you give them something, but in the end, you know, for them, it's just to, you know, to see how, how a, a specific work situation could look like. An apprenticeship is really, a, you know, a contract between uh, the, the learner and the employer. And you basically work towards, you know, acquiring, uh, you know, quite a, a, a broad range of skills through that relationship. And uh, it takes much greater responsibility for the, for the company. You know, I mean, interns are often not that well treated you know they are just mm -hmm. you know given yeah. a little task and then you know nobody follows up for an apprenticeship you know as an employer you want to lead that person up to the degree the qualification the individual you know is there to get a job so actually i think that's a very very different nature of relationship i would say even though you know the practical experience may have similarities mm. well, that, that's okay elaine thank you for the clarifying question and uh, andreas you know we have all kinds of uses to put the recordings of our Future Transform sessions. And I wish I could just, I'm just gonna edit that clip and just say, here is the difference. Cause it is, so, you express that so clearly. Thank you. Um, we had, um, um, I, I, well, let me ask another question along those lines. Um, two OECD members, uh, Switzerland and Germany, of course, are, are world leaders in, inter, excuse me, in apprenticeships. But most of the rest of the world is still struggling to catch up with you two. Um, in fact, I hear I hear all kinds of observations from business leaders that ah, if only we could be like Germany, you know, if only we could have the Swiss model. Do you have, do you have an, any advice for these nations trying to catch up to you? Well, you know, more interesting than Germany and Switzerland are perhaps those countries that have recently 
introduced those kinds of models quite successfully. You could look to Norway, you could look to Denmark. Uh, I think that's actually um, England has been experimenting with this. So I actually think there's been quite some some progress on that. And uh, mm -hmm. there's several things that are important. The first is, you know, you need to create a sense of equivalency for learners. You know, if vocational education is perceived as the last resort and university as the first choice, you know, the ed leaves a stigma and it's very hard to overcome. So first mm -hmm. of all, I think it's very mm -hmm. important to create a level playing field that you look at apprenticeship as a different mode of learning, but not as a you know lower level kind of skill acquisition. Uh, you don't associate apprenticeship with low blue color jobs, but you associate apprenticeship with you know the same kind of jobs that you could learn through in a university pipeline. I think that's that mo countries that do not get that right will have a very hard time with anything uh, that is applied learning. Uh, but I think it's possible. Uh, the other part is, you know, making it feasible for for employers. You know, many employers will tell you, well, it's a lot of money to, to, to teach apprentices. And then, you know, when I taught them, they're going to work somewhere else. So um, <laughs> you have to create an infrastructure for that. So mm. sometimes, you know, uh, Norway was very good. They create, you know, you know uh, shared uh, facilities for training. And uh, so the company had a benefit, the, the learner. Right. or they even allowed people to uh, share employers so you could basically do your apprenticeship in two three places there are many many really good answers i think you know the german and swiss models are perhaps harder to emulate because it's just historically grown you know it's very natural for employers to take responsibility for education well you don't have that you have to find you know your ways into this but i actually think a, a country that you know creates parity in esteem will succeed with this. I think this is not technically very difficult to do. Mm. That's, that's such an important cultural shift to make, though. Um, thank you. Thank you for, for answering that. Um, uh, the uh, uh, Ben, in a, in a note, uh, Ben uh, Waldowski uh, follows up. Uh, he says, in the United Kingdom and in the German model, the idea is to combine degrees with apprenticeships, not to do only traditional apprenticeships. Mm -hmm. So is there a both and combination that is appealing in other countries? Yeah, and I think that's really a, a very important point. You don't want that, you know, you have a degree and then, you know, some lower level qualifications for apprenticeship. You want to lead people to the same degree through different routes. You know, you can study in a classroom if that fits you best, or you can learn at a workplace if that fits you better. But uh, at the end of the day, you acquire the kind of skills that you need for a specific set of job classes. No? And, you know, the tech sector has generally become very, very good at that. You know, uh, many, many tech companies these days provide most of the learning experience through apprenticeship, you know, um, and, and uh, sometimes even through self-learning. So I think um, some sectors have understood that the world is changing so fast that, you know, educating educators is too slow to, to get people upgraded uh, quickly enough. No? So I think it's possible to do that. <clears throat> Good. Well, Ben, thank you for, for that uh, line of inquiry. And uh, about a month ago, we did a great session with Ben. So take a look at the um, at the archive. Uh, he's, he's a wonderful, wonderful uh, scholar and uh, thinker in this field. Um, uh, we have a, a video guest um, that I'm going to bring up. Um, this is our excellent uh, friend, uh, Ruben Puentadora, uh, who has been a great guest in the program before, one of the world's leaders in uh, educational technology. Let me bring him up on stage. Ruben, where have we found you today? I'm back at home base in Williamstown, Massachusetts. So slowly ending summer, beginning fall in this part of the world. Well, I bet that fall is coming faster and faster. Uh, well, welcome, welcome. I'm glad you could join us. Thank you. What would you Thank you. Do you so, want? I'm sorry, you were saying, Brian? Yeah, what would you like to ask? Okay, so Andreas, first, thank you for all the work over the years with PISA. It has been a treasure trove of information, really, and really foundational for much of the work that I've done myself. So I have a question for you in the context of some of the work you're doing now on the skills front. And I, I was curious to hear if you're seeing patterns in comparing, say, the upper income countries with the middle income countries, particularly probably, you know, given who's participated in these projects, generally the upper middle income countries. So I was curious to hear any patterns you've observed, anything in terms of, you know, differences that are significant 
in terms of what you're seeing for now, for the future? It's an interesting question. You know, I first of all, you know, the one observation that you can make very clearly is that the world is no longer divided between rich and well-educated countries and poor and badly educated ones, you know. Mm. Uh, and I can see that through the OECD lens, you know. If you look at PISA, the world's top performers are not members of the OECD, unfortunately. The many middle-income countries have actually, you know, seen dramatic uh, progress. What I also see is that many middle-income countries are incredibly innovative and dynamic. They understood that they cannot follow our pipeline model. You know, basically, you know, first develop schools and university. They know that they have to do all of that at the same time. Actually, I was <coughs> just, you know, last week had a really interesting meeting with the prime minister in Rwanda. And um, he said, you know, even if I have tomorrow the world's best school system, what I'm going to do is, you know, 90% of the workforce here who don't have the kind of skills that they need today. So they think about human uh, skills in a very different ways. You know, they think about this kind of niche notion of upskilling, reskilling is much closer to, to, to their hearts. Um, they also know that in one generation, people will see totally different worlds, you know, whereas we, you know, for us, you can always, you know, trust people who are older than you because they knew the world really well. I think if you live in those countries, uh, you have to look outwards and the forward. And I think in that sense, I'm actually quite optimistic. You look at a country like Vietnam, you know, 10 years ago, none of us would have looked to Vietnam as a, you know, high performing education system. Not today, they do as well as the United States at one tenth of the cost. So um, at least in school education. So, you know, I, I, I think we're probably going to see most of the innovation coming from countries that that didn't have that are not hostage of you know long traditions and institutional structures no. but you know you know, it's, it's also divided you know what is also clear is that many low and middle income countries um uh, have not even started on that path you know the unfortunately low skills equilibria are quite stable you know as a nation you can say i'm going to hire a lot of you know uh, low-skilled people and uh, put them into in, 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 a, in, a, in a big mass and then you know uh, at low margins uh, transform you know make money out of that and I think you know the, and these equilibria are very stable you do not move naturally from a low skills equilibrium and a high skills equilibrium and, and we do see that across countries some countries are really trapped in those kinds of work organization and you know if you live in that world why would you study hard you know, if there is no company, no employer around you extracting value from high skills, uh, then, you know, and why would you invest in good public education in those situations? And we have that, unfortunately, as well in middle, many low and middle income countries, you know, that that coin that we need to actually invest in human capital hasn't clicked yet. Now, and this is what makes, you know, countries like Singapore and South Korea so exceptional in the 1950s, 60s, when they were really, you know, incredibly poor they had nothing they said you know we're going to pull ourselves out of this by investing in in, in tomorrow's people thank you andreas that's you know that's absolutely fascinating and you know a, a, i have to say that it matches well with much of my own experience a, so a, a second related question then to go back to what you were saying about ai because i agree that <coughs> you're looking at a future for ai that's complementary rather than a replacement of uh, human agency, human skills. Mm -hmm. uh, I, again, are you seeing differences there between the high income countries and the upper middle income countries in terms of how you're beginning to see adoption of not <coughs> just obviously generative AI, but other J A AI tools into you know, daily life, the workplace, etc. Yeah, you know, it's very interesting. If you look at, um, you know, AI technology itself, I would rate, you know, the Western world, United States, uh, really very highly. If you look at large scale deployment of AI, you know, countries like China, mm -hmm. uh, Korea are mu much superior in this. You know, AI only works in conjunctions with big data. And if you do not manage to, you know, generate and harvest those kinds of data, uh, AI is not going to be particularly useful to you. And that's something that those countries uh, have figured out much faster 
than than the Western world. Now, so I think, um, and that that for me is the big differentiator. Not can you develop the technology, but can you bring it out in scale? The other part, you know, what we can learn from countries like like China is that they have developed an education workforce that is much more entrepreneurial and much more mm. research oriented. Yes. You know, if you are a a teacher in 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 a province like Shanghai in China, you teach only in a school, you teach only 11, 12 hours per week. And you have a lot of time to research with your colleagues to actually, you know, try out things to work with tech companies. And you can actually, you know, uh, you, you can almost start your own startup. Uh, and I think that's that's a culture we don't have. We treat educators often as, you know, knowledge transmitters. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a big limitation when you think about, you know, AI uh, deployment. So I think we're going to see, you know, big differences across systems here. Thank you. Thank you, Ruben, for those great questions. Um, and no, thank you. Really appreciate the opportunity to hear from you. Andreas. <laughs> thank you so much. Actually, if I can keep you on stage just for a second, we have two follow up sure. questions that, that came up um, in the uh, in the chat. Uh, Trish Uhl, um asks, uh, Andres, what do you think about the education experiment with Cardano blockchain in Ethiopia? Uh, I'm wondering if you've kept, if you looked at that or uh, Ruben. I'm not familiar with that. No, unfortunately. No, I, I, sorry, I'm I'm also not familiar with the details of it, other than just hearing that it existed. But no. Okay, well, Trish, you you got to share something with us so that uh, so that we can we Please. can chew on it. Um, and then a, a follow-up question actually has to do with globalization. There's a, a lot of talk in the geopolitical world, a lot of talk in the macroeconomic world, that globalization may be slowing down or retreating for multiple reasons. Uh, you know, different wars, uh, the pressure of populism from the right or the left in different yeah. countries. And I'm curious just if, it's a big if, if we see globalization pause or retreat a bit, how might that impact the dynamics you've just described about uh, middle income uh, countries and their ability to get students uh, jobs and connecting with other people? You know, in a way, I think we have already seen that in the education sphere, it's actually, you know, no harder in many countries for young people to study abroad uh, mm. economically or because it's harder to get visa. Uh, and I, I think that is one of the greatest losses that we will see. You know, I, I think, you know, cutting down trade a bit, you know, we all become a little bit poorer. That is sort of perhaps not so dramatic, but cutting down the sharing of knowledge. I mean, that's why how we became who we are as humans, because, you know, that makes us so distinct from, you know, the Neanderthals who lived in small groups and tribes and, you know, shared knowledge within them. And uh, I think our capacity to, to create, share knowledge, to have common languages, to communicate and so on, I think is our distinct advantage. And I think Giving that up for nothing, I think it would not be a very smart, smart choice. No. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, uh, and R Ruben, let me stop exploiting you. Thank you for uh, for joining us on stage. Now, oh, listen, my pleasure, and once again, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Uh, friends, we are uh, at the last uh, ten minutes of our conversation, so I want to make sure that you all feel free to have time to ask your questions and to share your comments as we go. Uh, the chat has been very rich with resources and some ideas, um, so I, I would be really happy to uh, um, to share more of that. Um, one question I'd like to put to you, um, Andreas, has to do with another large-scale macro trend, um, which has to do with how universities respond to the climate crisis. Uh, as the climate crisis deepens, as civil society responds more and more extensively to it, um, how do you think how are you seeing universities rethinking their operations, their teaching, their research in terms of climate change? You know, to some extent, actually, I think this is a model like, you know, it was scientists who collaborated around the world that, you know, put that net zero agenda together that then, you know, put pressure on policies to do something without, you know, that global collaboration of scientists around the world uh, we probably had seen very little political action. No, I, I actually think this is this is something that I like to see in many more areas. I think in many other areas, uh, research and education are too fragmented to achieve that kind of momentum. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do think there's f far more to do. And uh, 
uh, again, you know, what we often see is that scientists try to optimize their local environments rather than think globally about this. You know, if I build a windmill in the Netherlands, it's nice. But if I could help, you know, in India, shut down a coal plant, a plant mm -hmm. I can mm -hmm. make effect real change. And I think we haven't seen that kind of thinking enough that we deploy, you know, our intellectual uh, resources where they can actually make most of a difference on this climate agenda. Uh, this whole, you know, uh, issue around climate finance is something where you would want to see the academic world, the, 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 the research world playing much, much more actively so that we find solutions to those issues. I mean, we have figured out many parts of the economic agenda, but on this front, you know, I think there's a lot more that that uh, that we could do beyond, you know, the very local local issues that this that raises for us now. Well, thank you, thank you. Here, here. Um, the, the, that was a subject of my previous book, and so I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm glad to, I'm glad to hear uh, some uh, some some resonance on this. Um, the uh, we have another question too uh, from uh, uh, Wesson Radomski, and let me bring Wesson up on stage. Uh, here, let me just adjust this. Here we go. And uh, Wesson, hello. Wesson, among other things, is affiliated with Georgetown University, where they work with the uh, excellent think tank and incubator, the Red House. Wesson, what are you thinking of? Yeah, um, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a fascinating conversation, and I really appreciate everything you've been sharing so far. My question is sort of, in some ways, a continuation of Brian's question, looking sort of at what we're already seeing with migration trends, um, particularly in a lot of OECD countries, and what we can expect as the climate gets weirder in terms of kind of mass migrations of people. Um, I'm really curious to see, kind of from your perspective, what shifts you're seeing in institutions' kind of receptiveness to those new influxes, like what role you're seeing colleges and universities playing in absorbing those shifts? Very, very, you know, a uh, good question. And, you know, it it often breaks my heart how we leave the talent that actually is moving into our countries untapped. You know, I think people end up in refugee camps and do not deploy their skills because we can't figure out, you know, what an Assyrian electrician can do. Now, I really think, you know, the recognition of knowledge and skills, our systems are so arcane and so much linked to how you learn rather than what you know, that many young people, maybe older people also will never get a chance. So I think that is a big issue of the puzzle for me that we find, you know, uh, better ways to enhance global skills, mobility, better ways to recognize the knowledge and skills of people independent on the formal pathways they have gone through. If we had, you know, it, it, uh, my dream is that skills becomes a kind of global currency. You know, you mm -hmm. can accumulate it in whatever way you like, you can you know, invest it in whatever way you like, um, mm -hmm. but it is transversal. And, uh, you know, imagine we had a kind of ways to recognize people's skills. And, you know, someone who's working today in Kenya or, or, or Zambia could actually work for an American or European company remotely earn a good salary rather than, you know, taking a lot of hardship on themselves to travel around the world to find a job. Now, I do think actually, you know, a lot of the migration is the consequence of barriers on skills mobility. You know, mm -hmm. people feel, you know, my only way is I have to move from whatever Mexico to the United States to get a job. If you would actually say, look, you know, I know what you know, I know what you can do, and I'm going to give you a great job in my company. Um, we would see a very different world. And I think this is a solvable problem. This is something, you know, if, if we were serious about it, you know, in a couple of years, we could have answers to those things. And uh, I think the barriers that we have created, and I must say, you know, reflect the still highly monopolistic nature of education. You know, it's institutions that, you know, make a lot of money by awarding degrees and credentials rather than thinking through, you know, how can we make sure that we use the world's talent in the most effective ways. And I think the refugee, you know, migration kind of issues are, is, is a good symbol of, of, you know, the failures here. Thank you so much for, for those reflections. It's really helpful to hear your perspective. Um, do you feel like, do you know of any examples where you feel like there are countries or institutions that have begun exploring pathways to 
integrate refugees or migrants more fully into the labor force? Or is it really just like, we're just starting to figure out how much we need to do this? Yeah, and I, I think it's just that there's so much more that we could be doing. You know, I, well, you know, we, at the OECD, we have this OECD survey of adult skills that I mentioned at the beginning, where we test the skills of people directly rather than looking at degrees and qualifications. And we once, you know, just as an experiment, we administered that you know, test in a, in a refugee camp in uh, Italy and in one in Greece. And um, we actually found that many of the people sitting there were very highly skilled people you know again they had no certificate but they were, had very strong problem solving skills great numeracy skills all of that you know if we find a way to give them kind of an opportunity um i think uh, everybody would be better served and many of the you know what the if we if we do not address this problem we're going to see increasing you know skills polarization, economic polarization, social polarization, you know, uh, democratic political polarization. I mean, all of that in the end is a reflection of inequality in skills. No. So how, how, might, how might you, if, if we're talking about your dream, um, if, and if we're talking about possibility, which higher education is confronting right now, what are some ways that we might, that we might make skills the global currency? I mean, maybe uh, universally accepted micro-credentials, perhaps backed by blockchain or something else, uh, some kind of new body uh, to supervise this, or a kind of exchange between multiple bodies like the Bologna process across the European higher education area. How, how might we do this? You know, the, the, uh, the Bologna process in Europe did that for degrees and qualifications. I think that's all fine and good. But again, you know, uh, if we want to include people who do, did not go through formal degrees, we need to find another methodology. I actually think, you know, micro-credentialing, if we make them truly transferable, truly stackable, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that that could become a big part of, of, of the answer if universities uh, start to work effectively uh, together on this, if employers start to recognize them. You know, this is how currencies are born, ultimately. These currencies mm -hmm. are what, what people believe in. You know, they don't have any, and I think if we can, um, and also I think if we find better assessments, if we make um, the skills of people uh, just better visible. I think the problem of many micro-credentials now is that people just do not know well enough what they actually mm -hmm. entail. Mm -hmm. But I, I, again, you know, I think these are things that, uh, you know, <clears throat> scientifically can be addressed. And I, again, you know, I think universities could play a really important role in, in the research on micro-credentials itself. Now, not yes. just in, in accepting them, but you know, you could actually uh, study their value. You could look at, you know, uh, what impact do they have on, on labor market outcomes? What impact do they have on social outcomes? And then, you know, see how you can um, put them together. <clears throat> well, I could see that happening in business or economics, yeah. sociology. Uh, um, Listen, thank you for asking the, a, a great question uh, that brings everything up, and thank you so much. Thank you so much for taking the time to answer it and having me up here. Uh, we have uh, only one minute left, and in, in this one minute, I have to ask a kind of concluding question, which is it, it, you're, you're speaking to a bunch of academics of all kinds, um, and we've discussed so far a whole series of challenges facing higher education, challenges and opportunities, you know, from AI to micro-credentialing to changing the whole skills matrix to uh, in internships versus apprenticeships uh, to climate change. What advice would you give to um, a younger or mid-career academic, be they a, a, a chancellor or a, a, a scholar or even a student, what would you? What advice would you give them in order to help maximize the potential of universities? You know, I think farther out in the future. You know, I think often it's hard to imagine or think about a future when you are used to something else. And I think you know, looking outwards, and I, I think this is looking forward, looking outwards. I think uh, you you can see yourself through the through different perspectives. And I actually think you know. Uh, knowledge is our collective future. You know, everything that we have today as humanity has been the fruit of education. You know, our language, mm -hmm. our culture, our technology, everything. And I think uh, that, uh, but that education also has left us with some very fundamental disconnects in this world. You know, we talked about you know, the disconnect between, you know, the infinite growth imperative and the finite resources 
of our planet, the disconnect between what is technological possible and the social needs of people, the disconnect between our governance structures and the, the and the voicelessness of, of of many the disconnect between what we call our gdp you know measuring economic progress and the well-being of people so again you know i think these are the big questions that you know the academic world we need to find finances for for humanity and i think that's that's uh, often again you know we get too much trapped in in our current thinking and our current working in the in the in the present and i think uh in a way, people who work in education have the luxury to, you know, think across those boundaries and they should just yes. do that. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Um, thank you. Thank you for that advice. And thank you for joining us in this, this late afternoon, early evening in France. Um, I, I, this has been a terrific conversation. I've really enjoyed your, your reflections, your, your thoughts, and benefiting from your deep experience. What, how can we best keep up with you to see you know, what you're working on? Uh, do you have a, uh, are, are, are you active in social media? Is there an OECD newsletter that we should follow? What's Absolutely. And actually next Tuesday, we're going to uh, publish our annual education report. A lot on this on higher education, this time more on the financing of, uh, of higher education. You know, right. how can we, uh, and uh, there's a lot of stuff. I mean, our work in the OECD is really about, you know, providing evidence and data and making comparisons. Now that's, uh, but there's mm -hmm. a lot coming out. And then, you know, 10th of December is uh, the 10 yearly survey of adult skills. I think it's going to be an interesting data set and I'm mm -hmm. sure we can find ways to, to work on that together, Brian. Well, I'd like that very much. Um, and uh, thank you. Thank you again. Um, please, my best to your staff and uh, have, a good, have a good evening. Bonsoir, monsieur. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. But don't leave anybody else yet. We just had to, uh, first I wanna thank you for all the great questions and the great comments, especially for this unusual time on a Thursday. But then also I wanna point out where we're headed next. So if you'd like to keep talking about these issues, um, you know, ranging from apprenticeships and work to skills as a new currency, uh, please, here, here we are on social media. Just use the hashtag FTDE. You can find me here on Twitter, LinkedIn, Mastodon, Threads, or Blue Sky. If you'd like to look into our previous sessions uh, where we've hosted some of the questioners today, like Ben Olofsky, um, here is our archive at tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. If you'd like to look ahead to our upcoming sessions and everything from enrollment to grading to the future of teaching and learning centers to more changes to the workforce, just go to the forum website, forum.futureofeducation.us. Uh, thank you again for uh, this great conversation. Uh, I hope those of you in the Northern Hemisphere are enjoying the first touches of autumn as we head towards the equinox. Um, and I hope above all that all of you are safe and well. We'll talk to you next time online. Take care. Bye-bye.